Hello, my name is Ian Treadle from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and today I will be presenting how the Mars 2020 rover flight software architected its parameter management system for use uh, during our Mars surface mission. Uh, this design and the resulting code has operated now on the surface of Mars since the rover's landing uh, last February in 2021, and we're pretty proud of how it's working. So we wanted to share that with you today. So before we get started, uh, since the term parameter can be considered many different things, let's start by defining how we defined it on Mars 2020. So on our project, we defined a parameter as a software variable that is configurable, commandable, and retrievable from Earth and is not designed to change often. Um, so the parameters, they, they, all parameters have certain things. Um, they have a type, that's a flight software type, unsigned int, a float, a boolean, etc. They'll have a name that defines uh, how you address this thing, both in the dictionary uh, on the ground, as well as in the code itself. A description that describes what this parameter does, what it impacts, what changing it might imply. A default value, so that's the value that the parameter would have the first time flight software comes up before you've changed anything. Uh, or if you're on a new version of flight software, that's what you get. And finally, units. Uh, units are very important for parameters. Several missions have had uh, problems and several have been lost due to parameter units. Uh, so that's something we enforce all parameters having and those are checked properly um, uh, during our development process. Finally, some parameters uh, have a defined range that can either be a numeric range like zero to 10, or it can be a range defined by an enumeration. All right, moving on. Um, so Mars 2020 parameter management. So we inherited all of our software from the MSL, Mars Science Laboratory project. And then we uh, obviously changed that for the Mars 2020 surface mission, which is very similar, but uh, has a lot of differences. Um, so we needed to, we know at, at the start, we knew we had to manage over 60,000 individual parameters. Uh, those are spread across the entire flight software and a uh, hundred or so modules. Um, but we knew we needed to manage that many parameters. We had a, we knew we had a constrained flight software image size of 32 megabytes and that we wanted to reduce the code footprint the parameter system took, uh, to make room for additional payload functionality in Mars 2020. So. It was uh, an interesting problem. We had to take the same number of parameters and make it a lot, the code to manage it much, much smaller. Um, and then so we also wanted to add new functionality for the parameters. We wanted to do uh, unified commanding and reporting. So MSL had, uh, sorry, MSL had um, a somewhat unified commanding and reporting structure. Um, modules could change commands, that sort of thing that may make their parameter commands different than other modules. Uh, Mars 2020, we didn't want to do that. We wanted to have a unified system for commanding and reporting. Uh, we wanted to have onboard snapshot and reload capability that I'll talk about a bit later. And then we also wanted to do parameter level change commanding. MSL, in most cases, would not allow you to change an individual parameter. You had to change uh, the next level up in, in the tree of parameters, uh, the copy. And that led to commands where you had to reinforce 10 parameter values where you really just wanted to change one. So there's a lot of opportunity there for uh, command errors. And then finally, we also had existing requirements from MSL at a high level. We needed parameters to persist across flight software boot cycles, um, and we needed to support uh, numeric string and bit mask typed parameters. Um, there are subtypes below each of those kind of general types, but those are the three big ones that required specialized handling. So how do we organize things? So uh, logically parameters fell into a tree. Um, here on the slide, you see this is one modules uh, tree of parameters. At the top, you obviously have the module definition, uh, but which, um, so e each module that has parameters is gonna have at least one group of parameters below it. Uh, the groups allow you to encapsulate functionality for parameters. So you'd have one group in a module that Maybe these are your fault protection parameters. You have another group that's, well, maybe these parameters uh, control how some algorithm works. Below each of those groups are copies. So the copies are what gets stored out to non-volatile storage. Um, they also allow you to define multiple copies of the same group. So if you're defining, let's say, motor control algorithm parameters, and you've got six motors on board, you could define one group that say, here are my motor control algorithm parameters. The parameters are A, B, C. I've got six motors and I need six copies of this group. So you can define, okay, this group has six copies and you get six copies of those parameters uh, that you can then address individually. 
Um, so again, yeah, the copies are, um, each group is going to have at least one copy and the copies allow you to define multiple sets of parameters uh, as needed. Uh, and then the copy is the level at which the uh, parameters get saved off to non-volatile storage. Uh, and then each copy contains at least one parameter. So at the very bottom of the parameters, these are the individual uh, flight software variables that contain the parameter that you, you want to address from Earth and report on and all that. So we decided on a tree. It allows for easy traversal of in-memory structures, uh, both by the autocoder that does the autocoding half of this during the flight software build process, as well as the parameter management module. When you're reporting on the entire state of flight software parameters, it's a, it's a lot easier to, to traverse a tree than kind of other data structures that may not be quite as efficient for that. So that's why we chose a tree. It's, it's worked uh, pretty well for us. So looking at the runtime, um, there's a couple of big components in our runtime. Um, we have the parameter management module. That's a distinct module in our flight software code that handles um, most of the heavy lifting in terms of managing the parameter system on, for our flight software. And then you have the client modules. Inside those client modules, there's a little bit of uh, parameters auto code in C that gets compiled into the modules uh, object file as part of that module. There's also a, a very small interface that the, uh, the module itself has to call to initialize and register with the parameter management modules or in flight software initialization. But the parameter management module is really uh, the star of the show. It is what manages the parameters, interacts with the file system, non-volatile storage, data management system to accomplish all the things the parameter system needs to do. Um, so again, it, it defines the single set of generic spacecraft commands to uh, change, save, snapshot, reload, and reset to default all the parameters in the flight software. Uh, it coordinates parameter changes. So it, it receives the message from the ground says, I want to change parameter X to value Y. It then goes through a whole validation steps and eventually will send a message off to the client to coordinate that change with the client at an opportune moment in the client's modules execution. It does all the saving and restoring of parameter copies to non-volatile storage, uh, creates data products to report on metadata as well as the parameter uh, parameter values themselves. And it does, that, again, that snapshot and reload capability I've mentioned a few times here. Uh, the client modules, it's really any module in our flight software system that defines parameters. Um, it, it becomes a client module of the parameter system. It, it has that little bubble of uh, generated C code that defines the parameters and methods. Um, again, that's auto-coded. The developer doesn't have to do that. It just, it, the developer just defines what are my parameters, what is their general structure, and the autocoder creates the autocode for the developer. Um, and finally, yeah, the interface that the client module that a developer of a client module would have to call is really quite straightforward. It's call this initialization method, and then, hey, here's this magical structure of parameters that you don't really have to worry much about at that point. It's always going to be consistent. It's always going to be what is the proper onboard set of parameters at that moment in time. Uh, yeah. All right, moving along. Uh, we have the, uh, how do we build the actual autocode? Uh, this, is, uh, th this is a bit more of an involved process than I think we all understood when we started this. Um, but it is, uh, <laughs> it has been working well. So, uh, developers will define parameters in XML. Um, so they, there's an XML parameter definition file that follows a schema that gets fed into an autocoder written in Python. And then the Python autocoder spits out C code as well as a dictionary fragment. So that is the, the modules contribution to the overall flight software dictionary that then in a later stage of the build operation gets merged together to create the overall flight software uh, dictionary for parameters. So the uh, the Python autocoder is really the uh, the heavy lifter here. Um, it creates the C module and the, the dictionary fragment. It uh, basically takes the parameter definition file and creates the in-memory re representation of that module's parameter tree. From that in-memory representation, it checks for changes in parameter group definitions from the previous version of flight software. Uh, it re resolves C symbols into and macros into more primitive types. So if you have a, say a, a sign or a pi definition, it'll actually resolve it into what the, the uh, underlying number is uh, that can be used in a dictionary. And then uh, uses templating and it generates the C autocode and the XML dictionary. The C code, I think I've touched on this before, it registers the module with parameter management uh, module during initialization. Uh, it defines the overall, the, the, the C structure of the parameters. So the, the various structs at the, at the levels, the module struct, the group struct, and the copies below that. Uh, 
And it, <laughs> the goal is to create a bare minimum of C code required for each client to reduce the overall footprint of the, uh, the flight software parameter system. Um, so the, the C code it creates is, and there's not a lot of executable code, it's mostly data. Uh, finally, yeah, the XML dictionary fragment, it defines the module's contribution to the parameter dictionary. Uh, what else? The dictionary is created late in our build process. Once all the modules have created their fragments, another process comes along and merges those fragments together to create the overall dictionary. Uh, the dictionary is delivered as a flight software deliverable during our release process. And it's used by our ground tools to decode data products, uh, generate commands, as well as a few other tasks there. But it, it, it defines the full set of parameters available in flight software, their ranges, their constraints, that sort of thing so that operators on the ground know what they can work with. So touching a bit more on versioning, um, the versioning of parameters between flight software versions. Uh, when you're in test beds and you're developing is relatively easy. Uh, we clear our test beds uh, non-volatile storage before we start each run. So we have a consistent state to start from. That kind of makes this entirely moot for testing, but in operations, we almost never clear of non-volatile storage. Uh, barring an anomaly or something of that nature. So you have to worry about parameter versioning between flight software versions. So in this case, if you make a change to a parameter in version N, how does that impact the non-volatile storage record from the previous version of flight software? So let's take a look here. Um, so in this case, we have a parameter named foo. It has a type of U32, unsigned 32-bit integer. It is default value of one and a range of zero to 10 in the previous flight software version. So you release that, you send it up to Mars, and it operates on the surface for nine months, a year. And then you come along with a new version of flight software where the definition has changed slightly. The range is now zero to nine. So we need to be able to detect that change and validate the previous version of the parameters on Mars so that we don't inadvertently restore when we come back up from flight software from a, a sleep cycle, we don't inadvertently restore a bad parameter value into the, the now new version of flight software. So to do that, during the autocode process, we create this hash string that defines the parameter. It has the name, the types, the uh, values, the ranges, and uh, the units, uh, amongst other things. And uh, we, we take that and we hash it. That hash this get, gets then stored as part of our flight software release process. It gets stored in a file um, that then can be referenced in future versions of the flight software build. So when the new version comes along, the hash is gonna change. Yeah, the hash is going to detect the zero to nine. Hey, that's a different hash than the previous version of this group. I need to invalidate my previous copies and the autocoder will then take steps to increment the version number that it uses to address records and non-volatile storage. The result of this is that you're not going to restore the wrong non-volatile record into a new version of flight software. All right, at a more uh, kind of operational level, how do you modify a parameter in this, this kind of scheme? Um, so the, param the parameters change commands all come up uh, via spacecraft commands like everything else. The spacecraft command interpreter takes that and hands it off to the parameter management module, which will then handle the change from start to finish. So the parameter modification command will come in. Parameter management module will then validate, hey, is this a valid change for this parameter that's being addressed? If yes, uh, it will then notify the client and say, hey, you have a new parameter value. They'll send an IPC message to the client and the client will at an opportune moment process that IPC message. So it's important that, to note that clients have some control over when their parameters change. So in this case, the parameter management module will send a message to the parameter. If it's or the client module, if the client's in the middle of a long running operation or something else where it doesn't want parameters changed, it can effectively not process that message until they're a good moment. And the parameter management module will just wait until it gets a message back from the client and says, I'm done. Yes, I've switched over the, uh, the, to the new version of the parameters. At that point, the parameter management module will save out a record to non-volatile storage. And then once that's complete, it'll write out a data product uh, containing a checksum for the copy that was changed. So important to note there, we, we don't, uh, when we are validating or verifying parameter changes on board, we're not using uh, the actual value in the data products that get downlinked back to Earth, we are using checksums. And the checksum is that, that saves us a whole bunch of downlink bandwidth. If you had a parameter copy with 100 parameters in it, you don't want to downlink all 100 values. You just, we, we download a single 32-bit checksum. 
Uh, and the ground tools are smart enough to know that I know the state at time A. I know that I sent up a command to change this parameter to value Y. And I know the expected checksum when I get it back is this. So it really, the ground system is really taking all that into account and just verifying, yep, that checksum matches what I expected it to be. Therefore, I know the state on board at all times. Um, so our ground system's done a lot of work to make that work properly. And uh, that's it's a pretty nice system in terms of uh, you get pretty quick response of what your parameter state is on board at all times. Reporting, I touched on that a little bit, but the parameter management module handles all of the reporting. Um, so that requires read-only access of the parameters uh, in client module memory for reporting purposes. Uh, basically the parameter management module will reach out <laughs> and touch the individual uh, parameter modules uh, memory that holds the parameters because it knows where it is. Uh, that wouldn't really work in a time and space partition system, but we do not have that sort of a system, so we are allowed to do that. Um, that only works because parameter module, client modules themselves are also not allowed to write to those memory locations, only the autocode that switches a validated parameter value into the live version of parameters is allowed to do that. Um, so there, there's some protection in the parameter, parameter management module to only run reports when it knows there are no outstanding parameter commands in the system. Uh, so we can generate several types of reports. The value reports, if you needed to dump all of the onboard parameter values for whatever reason or a subset of those, you can do that. If you wanted to run a checksum of all of the copies in the system, you could do that as well via command. And that is also what gets generated during change operations is this, this checksum report. And finally, a summary. We, we generate a summary during every flight software shutdown that has all of the metadata for each module, how many parameters were changed, how many commands there were, that sort of thing. And that gets useful for just summarized, summarizing the overall amount of change in parameters from uh, one day to the next. So finally, the last uh, big piece of functionality in the parameter management module is the snapshot and reload capability. This is a new capability from Mars 2020 that we're very excited about. Um, so we have parameter state A, and it, say you wanted to save that parameter state for use in the future, you'd send up a command to generate a snapshot of all or part of the uh, parameter system. That snapshot gets saved off to a file in our non-volatile file system. Then you can change parameters to your heart's content. Uh, you get to parameter state B. And then finally later, if you want to restore the snapshot, you send up the command to say, hey, I want to restore this file uh, back into the parameter system. And you're back at parameter state A. Uh, this has been pretty useful for us in terms of uh, we use it a lot in mobility operations where we want to use uh, certain kind of groups of groups or copies of parameters in certain situations. We can save those off to a snapshot and then reload it later when we want to use that again. Uh, it's also very useful for seeding test beds with the current onboard state of parameters. You can just generate a snapshot of the entire parameter system on board, downlink that, and you're loaded up in your test bed and you have the exact same parameter state and your test bed that you do on board. It's been a pretty powerful tool for us that uh, uh, so far. So finally, uh, challenges and lessons learned. Um, two, two main challenges and lessons learned that I, I, I took away from this development. The first was the safe persistence of parameter values across flight software versions. I touched on that a bit with the versioning, um, but really in, ensuring that changes to parameter groups and structures don't result in the wrong record being restored between versions of flight software is a tricky problem. Tracking it has been more work than we thought it would be. <laughs> and uh, we, we ran into one pitfall where we are, we're using sequential addresses for our non-volatile storage records, uh, and which, which is fine again during development where you, free, you, uh, you format for each testbed shift. But when you're in ops um, in flight software, the old flight software version has one definition and then a developer comes in and sticks a group in the middle of their definition file because it makes sense to organize the file that way. The result is that all the parameter addresses below that point move down an integer, uh, which, which could lead to problems if the group definitions are very similar, that sort of thing. So um, we, as a result of that, I, I'd recommend using, again, sequential addresses for non-volatile records, use a hash, use something else similar to that, just to avoid this problem entirely. I mean, hashes come with their own problems, but um, yeah. And finally, yeah, allowing symbols as part of the parameter definitions. Again, this has greatly increased our developer flexibility. We have a common definition for pi. We have a couple of other macros we use all over the system. Um, it, it, it's very powerful for developers, but unfortunately create, we, we had to create a two-stage resolution process in our uh, autocoder, which we didn't expect, just to deal with that because uh, the way we had things structured, 
parameters went first in the autocoding, but to resolve all the symbols, you need to have the entirety of the C code available so you can run the preprocessor on it. Uh, we didn't have that, obviously, when the parameter was running at the first stage of autocode. So we had to create a whole other stage of autocoding at the end um, just to handle this. Um, but it obviously it creates uh, in increased flexibility for your developers. And re resolving these symbols is absolutely required because you can't have a, a flight software dictionary in it, a flight software parameter dictionary with symbols in it because they're meaningless outside of flight software. So your ground team has no idea what the actual ranges are, that sort of thing. Um, but, all right, I, I think that concludes our uh, relatively quick look at the Mars 2020 parameter system. Uh, thanks so much for your time today.